Thank you. Thank you, Rajini, uh, Dr. Deepak Pentel, Dr. Ram Murthy, other distinguished guests, and my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining today. And especially, I would like to uh, extremely grateful to Dr. Pentel, who readily agreed when we requested him to give this talk. And I also requested uh, Dr. Anindya to chair this session, so he also readily agreed. So I think we have a, uh, going to have a very good session. Uh, as you know, Dr. Uh, Raja Ramanna was the founding director of NIAS. He, along with uh, Sri, late Sri J.R.D. Tata, uh, set up this uh, unique uh, institute where uh, the most focus on how to integrate uh, science with the society and how we can address some of the important problems which uh, society is facing, not only Indian, but as a global society, how we can address them. And as you know, Dr. Raja Ramanna was a very multifaceted personality. He was uh, legend as uh, far as science is concerned, especially in nuclear physics. Uh, he was uh, chairman of Atomic Energy Commission, and also he became Minister of State, Minister of State in Defense when he was the Raj Sabha member. Apart from that, uh, he had a great interest in philosophy and music. He himself was a great uh, pianist. Actually, some of the books which he has written in those codes is in our library. And I then realized that he was not just playing as a hobby, but he was a very serious uh, pianist, <coughs> a very high caliber. So he himself has a multifaceted uh, personality. And I think that is why he thought that this kind of an institute, which is uh, very important to address. So Nias works on very multidisciplinary projects, uh, right from science, engineering, to music, to culture, to humanities, to social science, and you name it, to security. I think practically all this uh, work is being done in NIAS. And this is very heavily supported by extremely good faculty and a lot of other visiting uh, chairs and professors. And of course, uh, most important, uh, we have the about 75 PhD students who pursue their doctoral research in very much uh, very fields. So we are very fortunate to have a Dr. Deepak Pentel, who has been one of the topmost scientists country has ever produced. Of course, he's very humble, and uh, I'm sure that the topic which he has chosen today would be of great interest to all of us. And I'm sure that we will get some ideas to pursue further in NIAS from today's talk. With all this, I again welcome Dr. Pentel to this uh, and uh, show my gratefulness for agreeing to deliver 16 Raja Ramanna Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now request uh, Professor Anindya Sinha, Professor at NIAS in the School of uh, Natural and Engineering Sciences, to please uh, chair the session and introduce the speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajni. And uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Deepak Painter, uh, former Vice Chancellor of Delhi University from 200, 2005 to 2010, and currently at the Center for Genetic Manipulation of Crop Plants at the University of Delhi. Uh, Professor Painter has been working for more than the last 30 years, along with his colleagues and doctoral students, on the breeding of oilseed, mustard, and cotton. His group's work has led to significant breakthroughs in mustard breeding for higher yield, better oil, and meal quality, as well as for disease resistance. He has published around more than 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals that have received more than 3,000 citations. Professor Painter studied at the Punjab University for his bachelor's and master's degree, received his doctoral degree from Rutgers University in the USA, and did his postdoctoral research work at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Since 1993,
Professor Paintel has been associated with the University of Delhi. He is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, Indian Academy of Sciences, and the Indian National Science Academy, and has received numerous awards, which include the O.P. Bhasin Award for Research in Agriculture in 2008, the FICCI Award for Innovative R&D in Life Sciences in 2010, and the Lifetime Achievement Award in Agriculture by Mahindra and Mahindra Foundation in 2018. He is also a recipient of the J.C. Bose National Fellowship from the DST from 2009 to 2019 and was a CSR Distinguished Scientist from 2017 to 2020. <laughs> Professor Painter has written extensively on reforms in higher education and agriculture and supported the use of new plant breeding technologies to provide a better deal to the farmers of India. <clears throat> I must, of course, here add a little personal note because Professor Paintel has been an inspirational figure in my own personal life ever since I first heard him speak about 33 years ago, possibly in 1988, at the Molecular Biology Unit of TIFR in Mumbai, where I was a doctoral student. He, of course, spoke brilliantly, which is a hallmark of all his talks. But what moved me most <clears throat> was not only his passion for botanical research, but more importantly, his commitment to continue to work right here in our country using the latest techniques that molecular biology had to offer and contribute in his own way to our society and its economy. Please remember that this was a time when most of our brightest academicians were leaving the country, but Professor Painter's steadfast dream to be in India and work here showed me, as it did many, many of my peers, students at that time, that it was possible to do excellent fundamental and applied science in our own so-called third world country. Thank you very much, Professor Painter, for being my inspiration always. Thank you again. Professor Painter, you can perhaps go Thank ahead. Thank you very much for this generous invitation and very kind introduction. Indeed, it's an honor and a privilege to speak in the memory of one of India's greatest scientists. Uh, Dr. Ramana led India's nuclear programs. Uh, he also, as Dr. Naik was pointing out, was a brilliant pianist. So he was a very versatile personality. Uh, very few of us can reach that kind of uh, accomplishment. And uh, I, I really feel very privileged and honored to be speaking in his memory. I last visited your institute when Professor Amamurthy was the director and there was a program on agriculture related issues. Uh, and uh, uh, it's good to be back on the uh, maybe on the web only but uh, it's a real honor and I thank you for your kind invitation. The topic I have chosen is a very big one and I basically my interest is in how to advance India's agricultural uh, profile and whatever readings I've done on the subject uh, have told me that R&D has a key role in advancing India's agriculture and national prosperity. So I will be giving you some examples from the agriculture side. And at the end of the talk, I will like to discuss some general issues uh, which I feel should be uh, should be of consideration and of concern to every person who is working in the field of science and technology in the country. So I'll look for my slides now here. So is the slide visible? Not as yet, Professor Painter. Share. Just a second. 
Uh, this one, no. No, check. So we all know why we are here today. Are they? Is it visible? Uh, not as yet, uh, sir. Not as yet. What has done wrong this time? Why? Yes. Kathy? Yes, it's loading now, sir. It's it's loaded. Absolutely fine. So I recently wrote an article and which was published in Dialogue, which I circulated to some of my colleagues in the world of science. And uh, from the reviews I got, uh, I felt encouraged that we should be taking up some of these issues uh, further. And uh, so we start with the, about 12,000 years back when the sedentary mode of life started around agriculture in the Fertile Crescent in the Jordan Israel area. And uh, if you look at it, the global population, these are some kind of estimates. I don't know how accurate they are, but the global population till uh, 2000, BCE was very low. In fact, the global population started increasing, uh, as you would see in the year 1900 onwards, a little before that. But in Europe, there were a lot of pan pandemics. A lot of people were dying of disease. So basically, we had a health revolution in around 1800, 1700, 1800 times, starting with that. And the global population, as you would see, has increased tremendously since 1900. Uh, India alone would be peaking out at around 1.6 billion people in 2040, 2050. Uh, so the health revolution involved better uh, hygiene, Portable water, uh, better economic prosperity brought uh, better hygienic conditions. And of course, the modern medicine, which started only 1900 onwards, and vaccines, which started a little bit earlier than that. So, uh, how have we fed this uh, global increase in population? Uh, basically, post-1900, uh, we had Haber-Bosch process, which was one of the biggest breakthroughs in chemistry, uh, the nitrogenous fertilizers, because before that, we were feeding the increasing population only by increasing the land under till. Mechanization, which meant that many, much lesser number of animals were required for tilling, and of course, in the 1930 onwards, crop protection chemicals. And since 1900, with the rediscovery of Mendelian laws of inheritance, uh, systematic plant breeding, because we understood how traits are inherited uh, to some extent. So all these developments were absolutely key to feeding the uh, human population increase. Uh, we ourselves, we would recall some of us, some of our colleagues who are listening to this talk must have been born even after 1960s. But those of us who were very young and in school going age at that time, in the 1960s, India had a real food-related problem, and uh, we had to import a lot of food grain under PL 40 from, from the United States. And you can see the marvel of 
plant breeding in the in the 50s 40s and 50s and 60s uh, that the mexican varieties of wheat were introduced into india dwarf rice was introduced into india and the green revolution in asia led to uh, you can see the population increase since 1961 uh, the land under till is hardly uh, any more than about 5 to 10% more than what it was in 1960s and you can see the cereal yields and the cereal production are almost 220% increase and that is how we have fed uh, that increased population that you saw from since 1900 if you look at the historical yield increase in uh, the british are very good at keeping records and one of the best records are on wheat cultivation is from the United Kingdom. You will see that only around 1900, uh, in fact, even after 1900, in 1920s, that uh, yield increase started in earnest in, in, in wheat cultivation in the United States. So the dwarfing genes not only helped Asia, we think green revolution only occurred in, in Asia, but the European countries in North America and other parts of the world benefited from uh, these agriculture developments. Otherwise, they would have been also facing famine-like conditions. In fact, after, first, after the First World War, the situation was very precarious and the only fertilizers available were uh, the bird uh, excreta from South America, which was imported in a big way, and that was also running out. The other big thing in plant breeding has been hybrids. Uh, till 1940s, uh, the maize or corn yield in, in the United States, States was around two tons, and you can see now that it is touching 10 tons per hectare. Uh, so this is how uh, humankind has fed itself uh, through breakthroughs in plant breeding, fertilizers, mechanization, and uh, agrochemicals also. Now, what would you, what would we like to see in agriculture in India and in other parts of the world, uh, particularly in India, where uh, still very large percentage of the population is on the rural side. Almost 48% are fully or partly dependent on uh, agriculture, tilling the land and growing something or the other. Uh, so we require a low input, high output agriculture and low both in terms of natural resources and in terms of monetary costs, uh, which involve input of fertilizers, irrigation for which you need energy, agrochemicals, uh, cost of tilling and harvesting, and cost of seed. So I did some input output analysis from what is available in the literature. And I think the most serious thing which is happening with our agriculture is over use of water resources particularly groundwater in, in, in western parts, northwestern parts of India and in, in southern states also, wherever groundwater resources uh, can be mined. Uh, India uses 90% of its water withdrawals for agriculture compared to 64% in China and uh, about 40% in the United States and industry is consuming very little. And if we are going to be a prosperous country and we need to encourage manufacturing, then some water will be required for industry also. Uh, municipal usage uh, is going to increase only because more and more people would like to have access to uh, proper water resources for washing themselves, washing their clothes and <laughs> and the normal routine of water as urbanization occurs, there will be more stress on 
there will be more water requirement for municipal municipal usage also. So out of the total water withdrawals, wherever uh, rainwater is being used, that's OK. But in the groundwater usage, we have serious depletion of our groundwater resources, particularly in Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan and, and Western UP. And this is one area, I think, where uh, your institute must be looking at and can look at even more seriously uh, because uh, water shortages hit us from time to time in southern states. It's already very well known that there is a, whenever there is a quarrel, it's mostly on water only. Our fertilizer usage is uh, not very high. Uh, there is imbalance. We use more nitrogenous fertilizers because they are more heavily subsidized and less of uh, phosph phosphate and potassium. But the government of India has a good scheme of uh, looking at the soil nutrient levels analysis. And I think if we follow that seriously, uh, we can uh, take care of our fertilizer imbalance problem. But we are not using excessive fertilizers. Uh, we are not making good use of organic manure available from animal excreta because there is a problem of aggregation. We have a lot of animal excreta available, but aggregation and processing it properly uh, is, is, is an issue and needs to be looked at. But the pesticide usage, you would see that uh, the, 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 uh, India is, has very low use of pesticides. Uh, it is actually about 0.7 kg per hectare, and Africa is about 0.6 kg per hectare. And the other countries which profess to be very green and a very environment conscious like Germany uh, are consuming much more pesticides uh, than India is using. And strangely, we are still on the rural side, poisoning, uh, pesticide poisoning is very common. And I think because the knowledge is not there. And secondly, we are not using uh, the latest in pesticides because they're too expensive. Uh, we are using some pesticides which are banned uh, globally, uh, at least in the developed countries. And China, as you would see, is uh, using very high amounts of pesticides as compared to India. Now, that was the inputs. So to conclude on the inputs, our water inputs are much higher than desirable. Uh, our fertilizer usage is OK, but can be optimized. Our uh, usage of pesticides is very low, and we are leaving our crops mostly unprotected and therefore incurring huge amount of yield losses uh, in the country. Now, in the rice, the best breeding work in the country is on rice and wheat. Rice particularly because it is grown from north to south, leaving aside the desert areas uh, of western India. Rice is a omnipresent crop in the country. And some good work has been done on basmati rices in, in the north, uh, some specialized rices in south. Uh, and yet, if you see, our yields of rice are less than the global uh, uh, yields and as compared to China, you will see that there is a uh, there is a there is significant increase in productivity in rice in China in around 1980s 90s. As the curve as the graph goes up, the the bar goes up, and this was due to hybrid rice. Uh, we have not been so successful in hybrid rice, but uh, once again, I would like to point out that rice is still 
a very stable and a good crop for India. And in the north, farmers want to grow rice because it gives them four to five tons per hectare. And with the short MSP, the farmers of Punjab, Haryana and Western UP do not want to move to any other crop. And I will discuss this issue again uh, when I come to other crops. In wheat also, uh, both these crops, uh, we have benefited from spillovers also because globally they are the most intensively uh, researched crops and there is cement in uh, in Mexico and ERI International Rice Research Institute in in uh, in Philippines, uh, which have also contributed to increase in productivity besides the work of our own 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 breeders. Uh, but when we we have, as you would know, that we have sufficient uh, production of wheat and rice. In fact, we have sometimes storage problem and we are over producing uh, more than what we can utilize or what we can consume right now and uh, therefore crop diversification is required because wheat and rice uh, or continuous cultivation of rice are exhausting the soils so we need to move to other crops uh, we are deficient in oil seeds we are deficient in uh, legume crops and legume crops, they fix their own nitrogen, so they are good for the soils. So we need crop diversification. But the problem is that uh, most of the crops that we want to diversify to are low yielding and are heavily susceptible to pests and pathogens. Uh, for example, our maize yields, maize is uh, seen to be a replacement crop for rice in northern India and in parts of south. Uh, it requires less water than rice, but our yields are uh, just 2.5 tons per hectare. And when we come to more drought hardy crops, less water consuming crops like sorghum, uh, millets, uh, we are hovering around one ton per hectare, even though these are C4 crops and they should yield three to four tons, but uh, we have difficulties with these crops. And uh, uh, millets, we have done a little bit better. Uh, basically, they are grown in Africa and we are doing a little bit better in millets at about 1.5 tons per hectare but the yields are still too low for farmers in the in the wheat rice area to switch to these type of crops. And in oil seeds, we have a huge deficit uh, anywhere from 70,000 to 80,000 crore worth of edible oils we are importing uh, every year. And uh, our own uh, production is lower than what we are importing and we would like to diversify into these crops like soybean, groundnut and uh, mustard, but the yields are again around uh, one ton, 1.23, 1.2 tons per hectare, around that. Uh, they have not increased. You, if you look at mustard, our yields are, uh, lesser than that in China and Canada, uh, which also, which grow rapeseed, mostly not mustard. But you, you would see here that uh, these countries had much more better increase in their yield potential because they, they started growing hybrids. And in, in India, we, st we are still struggling to put hybrids out in the field. Our own work on mustard hybrids is lying on the shelf because we used a genetic engineering technology for pollination control to make hybrid seed. So these crops can be of, can give two to three tons per hectare, but they are stuck at uh, 1.1 to 1.2 tons per hectare. You can see for soybeans where, which was, which is grown in about 10 to 11 million hectares of land in central India, uh, 
since 1992 uh, to till 2018 we are hovering around 1 ton per hectare only and the farmers deserve to have better yields so why are we having so low yields uh, every crop is having couple of uh, problems like human beings we know we are susceptible to diseases and pathogens uh, same way crops are also susceptible to and here this is a very old paper in 2002 we did a survey with the plant breeders in india to find out what is what are the limiting factors in our crops and you can see that rice suffers from blast disease sheep blight bacterial blight stem borer brown plant hopper wheat suffers from rust diseases in fact after mexican wheat the biggest miracle is that globally we have rust resistant wheat varieties uh, which are saving us from hunger uh, because these rust diseases once they spread uh, they spread like wildfire and can destroy the entire crops and this has been doing by done by plant breeding only uh, to mobilize genes from the relatives of wheat into wheat uh, to give us resistant wheats so maize stem borer so i just i just want to highlight that like human beings or like any other biological species uh, plants are highly prone to these to pests and pathogens and tackling these is going to be uh, should be our highest priority to make our agriculture more productive in chickpea and pigeon pea pot borer was a big problem uh white fly spreads yellow mosaic virus in mung bean and old bean and cotton you know you would recall that there are controversies around bt cotton but bt cotton has has been saving the crop from american bollworm which is the biggest pest on cotton but there are other pests like white fly gessets and so on and so forth the same way in soybean uh, weeds shave off about 20 to 30% of the yield and other diseases are causing havoc with the with the soybean disease potato in india suffers from the irish famine causing late blight disease is prevalent all over the world and what is the way in tackling this either pesticides or we use genetic uh, inputs Uh, there is no third way in dealing with these uh, pests and pathogens we have to stay one step ahead of them as we know from our covid experience that pathogens mutate they change uh, the crops we have changed to for higher productivity but we need to uh, make sure that there is enough defense in these crops and and the genetic uh, means could be a way if it is done through open research and if the country becomes strong in r&d in agriculture it will be possible to provide the farmer crops that are resistant to pests and pathogens uh, through genetic means rather than excessive use of uh, pesticides but either way we cannot after spending so much money on irrigation schemes dams canals uh, pump sets uh, and subsidizing fertilizers we cannot afford to have low yields uh, and and we cannot afford to have no alternatives to wheat and rice uh, which are highly water consuming crops so what is new in plant breeding technologies uh, all these new technologies are based on recombinant dna revolution which started with uh, the elucidation of the structure of dna by watson crick in the 50s and the whole field of biology has not looked back after that and it's a great example of how fundamental discoveries in science can be converted into technologies 
the recombinant DNA work. Uh, in fact, the gap between discovery and and uh, application has narrowed down so much uh, that you can really call it research and development in the true sense. Uh, that is what has happened in the biological sciences. And part of that uh, technologies have given us molecular markers and marker assisted breeding, which people do not have much objection to uh, because it is conventional breeding, but made more precise. Once you tag a gene or tag a trait with a marker, diversification becomes much easier. Uh, so it's a, it's a big, it's a very good news that we can use molecular markers for diversification. And uh, uh, this is this techniques that these techniques are being utilized in the developed countries in a very big way. And in India also, we have started using these uh, late by about 10 years, but at least we are getting there and number of projects have been funded by the Department of Biotechnology and for diversification of the knowledge which is uh, from outside and, and the knowledge that we have generated. Uh, the main issue is with the two technologies, genetic engineering and gene editing. Uh, in genetic engineering, as you know, it's, it has been very controversial uh, and there are very strict biosafety regimes uh, but these techniques are of very high potential value and wherever they have been used, uh, it has led to betterment only. In fact, all the academies around the world have scrutinized what has been done by genetic engineering around the world and they have found that there has been no harm caused by whatever uh, crops have been taken out uh, through this route. And where, why do you need genetic engineering? because sexual crosses are possible only to some extent. Uh, if you want to put a bacterial gene into a plant, that is only possible through genetic engineering. But all these technologies are uh, the contribution of recombinant DNA revolution. And more recently, gene editing. Uh, except Europe, every other country in the world has accepting gene editing in agriculture crops. Uh, but in India, we are still a little bit confused on whether we should use it or not, which is very unfortunate. And of course, we all know that there is genomics revolution starting in by at the turn of this century by human genome sequencing and sequencing of a VD plant, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, which has become the model system in understanding plant biology. There are some issues, I, uh, rather than the biosafety issue, I think the other, the, the, more, the major issues which should be under our consideration are that the new technologies, uh, both pesticides and genetic engineering technologies and gene editing technologies are getting concentrated in the hands of a few uh, transnationals. And these transnationals have consolidated in a big way. Uh, Bayer and Monsanto were big companies in their own right, but Bayer has bought up Monsanto and uh, it's uh, about 26 billion US dollar turnover uh, company. Uh, Dow and DuPont, DuPont, have, DuPont have merged. Uh, China bought up Syngenta, one of the big agrochemical and genetic engineering technology company. So you will see from here that Europe and the United States and China have taken care of their future needs, both in pesticides and in new technologies by having these big companies in their, uh, in their geographical location and with a transnational, uh, with, a, uh, with a global reach. Uh, we do not have any uh, large companies of that dimension. In fact, our seed companies are not even listed in terms of R&D recognition. Uh, 
So we are dependent on open source knowledge. And I would make a case for that if we want to continue that way, we have to do more R&D because these companies are spending almost 3.5 billion US dollar on trade enhancement and about 2.8 billion dollars on pesticide discovery, uh, all put together. So huge investments into R&D, uh, but we cannot be, uh, we should not feel secure by uh, spillovers only. We have to increase, improve our profile in R&D in a big way if we want to cope with the future challenges of climate change and the crop diversification, so on and so forth. Now, I just wanted to come to mustard, the crop on which I have worked. There are five major issues with mustard, and that's why even though it's grown in about 6 million hectares, it is a crop which, is, which requires very little water, and about 80% of the area under mustard has some uh, irrigation facility and yet it, it is suffering it is low yielding crop because it suffers from a disease called stem rot shown on the top left panel it has alternaria blight which does not allow its uh, uh, cultivation in areas like Punjab and foothills there is white rust for which we have done some good work and we have made the crop resistant to white rust but not to the other two uh, diseases. And there is a problem of aphids, which you can see in the lower panel, and also a root parasite, Orobanke, which is destroying the crop in, in about 2 million hectares of land in Rajasthan and, and Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. So until and unless we take care of these pests and diseases, either through pesticides or through genetic means, uh, these crops are not viable crops, at least for replacing uh, wheat in uh, wheat and rice, uh, where we desperately need uh, crop diversification and less water consuming crops. And it's a myth that, you know, the, 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 there's a uh, arms race between pests and pathogens and hosts. Uh, this is a banyan tree which is growing wild at the back of our flat on the JNU boundary. And you will see that this also has diseases. Uh, you can see the leaves and the, and the new flush which has come up in the rainy season is all infected very badly with some fungal disease. But if you grow banyan tree in millions of hectares, Surely it will attract even more virulent forms of diseases and you will have to constantly uh, do something to it to stay ahead of the, the pests and, and, the, and the pathogens. Uh, organic cultivation is thrown by ideologues as a way of agriculture which, is, which would be benign, but I, this data is taken from a site in Switzerland, which is the most uh, uh, friendly site for organic agriculture. And you will see that uh, out of the cropland area of about 1,590 million hectare, only about 20 million hectares are under, under organic certified organic crops. And there's not enough manure to uh, as a speciality it can be done it will be useful to add more manure to the crops but the way to go is conservation tillage where we return the the residues of the previous crop to the soil to increase the organic matter and use manure as much as possible and not putting organic as a uh, panacea for uh, global agriculture uh, in the GE crops, even though there has been so much hostility, mostly from European countries, uh, in 1996, only 1 1.7 million hectares were under genetically engineered crops. Uh, today, it is around 190 million hectare. And that 
also because of the hostility towards it otherwise uh, if the if it if we were allowed to do it within the biosafety permissible biosafety limits uh, and not ideologically opposed i think much more land would have been under uh, genetically engineered crops and of course gene editing uh, i i simply don't understand we have been doing radiation mutagenesis of crops for all these years mutating genes to make them the crops more palatable or to remove a secondary metabolite or to reduce their flowering time now we have a much better technology which zeroes on to only the gene of interest and with all the genomic knowledge uh, and the genomic technologies have become so much cheaper that even a lab like ours could do an excellent uh, genome assembly of mustard uh, from telomere to telomere at the chromosomal level uh, and even the pan genomes have been sequenced there is so much information available today in 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 the area of genomics and if you are not going to utilize this knowledge uh, i think it would be the biggest tragedy of uh, uh, modern times so what is the issue uh, i'm just coming to uh, what needs to be done if you look at it uh, we just spend about 0.3% of our agricultural gdp on agriculture r&d in name we have 106 institutes 63 universities but very little new research uh, mostly spillovers and wherever we have done some good research uh, on our own we have tremendously benefited from it like for example uh, new varieties in basmati rice or new varieties in rice in general and sugarcane uh, breeding there are some breakthroughs but much less than what is expected from a country of our size and uh, and the amount of land that we have under cultivation this was a surprise for me a couple of years back i learned that india is spending only about 0.7% of its gdp on r and d uh even low and middle income countries are uh, investing more and you can see in china which was spending about a similar percentage in 1996 has moved on to more than 2% of its gdp and all the countries in the world i looked at it only russia has slightly come down from its 1% gdp Uh, expenditure but in india we seem to be uh, spending far less than we should be uh, there will be some arguments made that in the other countries two third of the expenditure is on uh, is by the companies and in india this expenditure is less than 50% but if if the industry is not in a mood to spend or is it's not a kind of industry like electronics which spends a lot on r&d or armaments india's armament r&d is all in the government sector so i think what we need to press and make a case to the government uh, without falling into party lines and being partisan with which political party is ruling the country india must improve its profile in the amount of uh, money that it is investing in in r&d so what needs to be done higher investments is one straightforward point if commitments are made on higher investments uh, that itself will bring some cheer to people that we are serious about r&d in our country uh there should be comprehensive project funding the competitive funding system is a very important uh very important in all the developed countries and in india also but we partially fund the projects uh, leaving lot of burden on the universities or on the institutions 
So we should use the global practice of comprehensive project funding. Uh, the third point I'm very keen on, if you look into agriculture, there are no experts in genomic breeding in, cat, in livestock in India. There are very few people in protein engineering in the country. There are very few people in statistical genomics. So how do we enhance competency in these areas? Unfortunately, in agriculture institutes, they have their own agricultural research service. Nobody is hired from outside who has not done a degree from the agriculture universities. And after that, how do you create competencies? For example, in biology today, if people are not proficient in data handling and in computational areas, uh, that means they are not going to be competent to doing tomorrow's uh, biology. And we need to interact with the glo global best labs. Uh, Raja Ramana, Dr. Raja Ramana did his PhD at King's College. I think he must have benefited from that. Uh, it's not necessary that everybody should go abroad. I must make it very clear, but not sending people out in the areas in which we have weaknesses and where we need the new developments to grasp the new developments, I think is the biggest weakness uh, in our national R&D programs. And finally, not everybody should get higher salaries by becoming directors. We should have prof national professors or a, a cadre of people who will be totally devoted to R&D uh, in agriculture, we know of some people who have been, who are like marathon runners on a crop, go on and on and on, and such people should be kept on uh, in there as professors, getting the same kind of salaries as directors or vice chancellors get. These are small measures, but can give us the way forward that it is the work which is more important. And I think one of the major problems is the way we uh, spend the funding that we receive in the competitive project. There's so many financial objections. There's so many uh, roadblocks on the way. It, it's like a race in which you don't know where uh, something will be put in your way while you are running. So all these things can be changed. In fact, the national new education policy suggests a new funding agency. Uh, it's important. It may be useful to create a new funding uh, agency, but it is the way we fund and we must put some trust in the principal investigators so that they can utilize the funding in a proper way. Uh, maybe they can be guided and in that way they will be ready for when they take administrative posts also, uh, how they should tackle their institute rather than becoming stumbling blocks in the in the in, in in our pursuit of research and development work in the country and finally we have to have manufacturing and production in the country so we need some industry for example good seed industry which is our own which can compete with the with the transnationals and that is required across the board whether it is electronics, whether it is drugs or vaccines or any any other area of research. So I think I've said enough and uh, I will be happy to take any questions or any critique or any point that uh, the listeners have to make. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pint, uh, for the uh, most comprehensive and uh, where you summarize so much what lies ahead and where perhaps we have failed in the past and where we need to take up uh, more work. Um, so thank you very much once again. Uh, I the, the audience, it's now open. The talk is now open for some sort of discussion and questions. Uh, may I begin with uh, Dr. Shailesh Nayak? Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pentel for uh, excellent overview and a uh, lot of insight into the issues which we need to handle. I think uh, the one of the, of course, uh, I'm as a layman question, uh, 
but this uh, debate about genetic engineering and all these crops was going on, uh, some suggestion came that uh, we can do it, it's fine, it is for some grains or oil seeds where we need to increase the production, but not for the vegetables like Briti Brinjal or something. We can have more varieties of Brinjal and all that. Uh, what is your view of it? I may be completely wrong, but uh, you can <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but your views will be very important. See, the point is whether the intervention which has been done is uh, is biosafe or not. If it jeopardizes uh, humans or other safety issues, then we should be very careful. Uh, but uh, for example, mustard hybrids in six to seven million hectares would make much more impact than a technology in Brinjal, which is grown in uh, half a million hectares. And more and more uh, vegetables are going into uh, enclosed cultivation. I mean, wh what Europeans are doing, for example, and they are lucky that they have cold climate, so it is easier to heat up a greenhouse than to have an air-conditioned uh, greenhouse, which is much more uh, in, in terms of energy costs. But you can stick a pheromone, uh, you know, uh, strip and catch whatever one or two white flies are floating around. But when it comes to uh, our country, um, we can do protective agriculture for for uh, vegetable crops. But again, with fruit crops, we will have a problem because they are, they are grown over a big acreage. And therefore, we would require some R&D in, in new generation pesticides also. We will require genetic engineering also. We will require genetic editing also. And I assure you that our precautionary principle is so highly biased towards precaution that uh, nothing untoward will go through. Uh, at least we should have put confidence in our committees and, and experts that they would be very careful in releasing something. But I think our situation is such that we cannot have the luxury of uh, European countries uh, where neither population is increasing nor uh, and there they have such sophisticated uh, agriculture a lot of it is protected agriculture and and yet you see that they are using more pesticides than we are using so it's not that their agriculture is pesticide free thank you thank you very much thank you uh, Dr. Partha Sarthi. He's muted. Dr. Partha Sarthi, you're ah, muted. Yeah. Okay, ah, yeah. fine. Am, am I clear, sir, now? Yeah, yeah you okay. are. Uh, sir, recently they used probiotic uh, seeds to save water consumption. Uh, I would like to learn from you how much water we can save using the probiotic seeds? I don't know what probiotic seeds are. Uh, <laughs> okay, recently... They are coated uh, with some microorganisms. Ah, 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 yes, 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 yes. No, see some beneficial microorganisms, if you increase their numbers in the soil, it's uh, good for. Uh, all we require is some good preparations of uh, inocula, and not uh, uh, flimsy things. Uh, okay. it, 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 we know that certain microorganisms help crops to establish better. Okay. So if th that can be done, if somebody has some good experience and production is there and the cost is, uh, it is cost effective, it can be done. For water saving, basically for water, saving the water. No, water is, some water is essential to grow anything. Uh, okay, okay. You know, thank you, sir. Thank you. In fact, one of the issues is that rice is going to become such a stable crop because there is multiple labs around the world doing excellent work on rice. And we are also benefiting from that. So the farmer would not like to go out from rice 
which gives them four to five tons per hectare and switch to a one ton per hectare crop, uh, which either the government has to subsidize again, but how far you can keep on subsidizing. You have to be productive to take the yes. economy forward. You cannot be subsidizing everything under the sun. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Namaskar. Uh, Professor Paintel, uh, um, I, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one was that you pointed out the spectacular advances that have been made in the molecular biology of agricultural crops, but you also bemoaned the fact that very few of us are actually exploiting the knowledge that we have gained uh, in this regard. Uh, do, uh, what do you think are the reasons why uh, most of our laboratories have not really picked up on agricultural research using molecular biology techniques, uh, which of course hold a tremendous amount of promise. Uh, where do you think the stumbling block lies? And my second question related to this is vis-a-vis -vis molecular biology techniques. We've of course had traditional breeding techniques, which have led to the development of different traits, uh, beneficial traits for crops. And the advantage of that, of course, is that we could select uh, a sub, uh, sort of uh, uh, try and select for local variants, which would do well and build up on these uh, gene banks or seed banks. Uh, so how much of that research is still going on? And do you think what does the government need to promote that further? There is there is a lot of work on traditional method of plant breeding, and it has been very successful. Right. Uh, you know, human beings have been, first of all, selecting the, the farmers have been selecting for crops yes. that where the seed pod will not shatter uh, right. the, for larger, for traits which are visible to the eye. Right. Uh, we have been very mm. successful in breeding for those. Mm. But uh, as, as you would realize that disease is comes and goes yeah and and the pest attacks are going to increase only yes they are already chewing up a lot of our uh, our crops and that's the reason for low yields and these things we had no solution for it except pesticides right and fungicides so that is where the new genetics comes in because these are harder goals to get. Take, for example, mustard. Uh, the necrotrophic fungi, uh, stem rot and alternaria blight. There is no germplasm available which is resistant, which can sexually cross with mustard and provide that. So the only method is genetic engineering or gene editing or chemicals. There is no third. Third thing is abandon the crop and move to something else. And we do not have that many choices in terms of uh, uh, crops. We have to, if we want to make sure that India becomes sufficient in oil seeds, we have to get the higher yields from soybean uh, and from uh, groundnut and from mustard. These are the three big crops grown in almost uh, uh, 25 to 30 million hectares of land and something needs to be done with these crops so that they can be alternatives to wheat and rice and they can yield more and the farmers are happy in growing them today farmer is not happy and if if i put a uh, put a genetic engineering solution which is goes to the farmer very cheap they will take up the technology in no time mm. yes it's like like bt cotton it spread like anything if our mustard hybrids ever go out within five, six years, you will find that 80% of the farmers will be switching to uh, because it's a public uh, pay for funded technology. It's going to go very cheap. The seed production is very high in the hybrid seed production terms. So it will be replacing varieties in no time and the farmers will get 20, 30% more yield. So the farmer will be very happy. So what is preventing this, Professor Painter? Preventing is uh, we have, uh, you see, ideologically left f felt that transnationals will bring these technologies. We are not capable of generating our own technologies. 
and uh, in the left ideology, the people are wary of uh, transnationals and yes. uh, rampant capitalism. Right. Uh, the right, I don't know. They're supposed to be nationalists, but uh, they want to go back to some agriculture which doesn't, yeah. which was never fulfilling the demand. Yes. It's a pre-1900 it agriculture which cannot feed people. Absolutely. Very true. So I, I don't know what, what people are really looking for. I, I fail to understand that. Exactly. Yes, that's true. Very true. Yeah, very frustrating. Professor Ramamurthy wants to say something. Yes, Professor Ramamurthy. See, this point, last point which you mentioned clearly points out that the weakness is in the communication. We are not able to tell our decision makers uh, that they, this is, these are the options. If you want to go over the traditional way, you, your industry has to start. You cannot depend on Western industry, uh, industries to supply everything for you. You, you have an easier option. We have the capability and you said it is in the shelf. It is not in the shelf because uh, shelf likes it. It's a decision by somebody who doesn't know why is he taking that decision and what are the consequences of that. So that's a basic requirement of uh, communication to the decision makers. Farmers will take. They don't need a communication. They see the result by the neighbors. It is a decision maker who are sitting in a cabin and he doesn't know what is being done. It's uh, you're so very right, Professor Ramamurthy. Farmers are all in touch through cell phones and through the modern systems of communication. Yeah. And you would know that BT Cotton was already in the field. It was the government which was dragging its feet. <laughs> And same is with BT Brinjal. It's already growing. I understand. Yeah, it's already there in the field. Oh, our only problem is that as government uh, people and done research with the public sector money, we cannot be releasing people uh, <laughs> technologies uh, like that. For example, the glyphosate resistance is the only way to tackle uh, this root parasite orobanke. Uh, the, I, I don't know of any other solution. Tomorrow somebody may come up with some brilliant idea, but that will be again based on gene editing or genetic engineering only. Because in the germplasm, there is no resistance to orobenke. And, and it takes 10 to 15 years to transfer a gene from an ill-adapted wild plant into a crop. In, in, in India, we don't have the patience to do that kind of work, unfortunately because people move on to uh, the more lucrative administrative jobs rather than <laughs> sticking to the bench and doing some uh, uh, hardcore marathon running. Um, Professor Pendel, if I may ask you something completely off track of this, I find that if you look at urban India, most of our children, our younger generation, haven't even seen uh, agricultural crops being grown. I mean, uh, most of them don't use trains anymore, perhaps buses are not used, so they don't even have an opportunity to uh, look around and see how the country is being fed. Um, and would you, uh, I mean, this is, I, I know it's a very strange question, but do you think at some level we need to take agriculture knowledge, uh, our understanding of agriculture to the school uh, level? Um, how do we bring that in? How do we make them more sensitive and aware of the requirements? In of fact, the and there, this is a bigger, much bigger problem in countries, in European countries, and in even in the in the very in the developed countries where only two percent population is on agriculture. Right. And the agriculture has got so much industrialized there. Farm size is 150 to 200 uh, hectares. Even in Europe. 50 to 60 hect uh, hectares uh, farm size. So people are so far away from uh, those days when hunger was yes. staring at us. Uh, and and you know this is a this is but natural that if if I am offered two melons 
and I am told one has not been sprayed with anything, uh, and it's, it's, it's a bit smaller, uh, and the other melon is bigger as nutritious, but I say there have been four times it has been sprayed with pesticide. If I have money in my pocket, I'll say, give me the smaller one. Mm. I mean, I will even do that. Right. So this knowledge has to be taken to the public also at large yeah. that Absolutely. you have only two big choices, either use chemicals and and we cannot get away from using the chemicals also. Uh, but we can reduce their usage as little as possible by genetic means. I just don't see any other way in my, uh, you know, and you, you said why young people are not working on this because yes. everybody is so demotivated. In exactly. fact, uh, if yes. you look at the number of publications coming out from our uh, neighboring country, China, in uh, genomics and in genetic engineering and in uh, gene editing particularly. I mean, there would be no comparison. We have not even started with gene editing. And younger people tell me, uh, why should I do it if it is not going to go anywhere? Mm. Yeah, that's that may be an excuse, but it, 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 is a, it becomes a genuine excuse if year after year you are postponing the release of anything. Correct. Yeah, no, I, I, yes, very, very, yeah, yeah, very important. It's all connected at some level, and I think it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle at some level. It is stuck up in a vicious circuitry right now, but it is cutting our own, it's cutting the branch on which we are sitting actually by yeah. not using technology. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all the varieties that have been developed by our agricultural communities over centuries. I think we don't even have a good seed bank which can actually protect and preserve some of these traditional varieties. Which no, could... Fortunately, one good news I can give you is that DBT and even ICR has funded a large number of projects on germplasm evaluation for diseases. Oh, good. That's and uh, these projects, I hope in the next 10, 15 years, if we handle them properly and if uh, ICR laboratories interact well with the DBT institutions and universities. We can improve our profile in R&D to a much better level. It sure. is a GE and GED where there is a problem. And of course, in the marker assisted breeding also, we have been so late in taking germplasm out. It's only been done uh, uh, two, three years back. We started right. funding these projects in a big way, but right. better late than never. Yeah, exactly. Before we lose all the varieties, that's what is most worrying. Yeah. So I think uh, we had a extremely good uh, lecture and good interaction. Yeah. yeah, we must be thankful to Dr. Pentel to bring out this, some of the very important issues. And also he said that what we ask can do it to sort it out. So I think we need to have some other discussion on that, what we can do, yes. well, how we can influence or how we can communicate this to right people. Right. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much for thank this. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for so inviting me to deliver this talk. Thank you. Thank you. See you again. And we look forward to uh, once the pandemic is over, we look forward to having you with us physically. In it will be a pleasure. You have a beautiful institution. I remember my visit uh, to your yes. institute. It's very nice. Yes, and we look forward to hosting you again. Yeah, yes. yeah, it will be a pleasure. So thank, thank you, you once again. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Rajni. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Institute, thank you once again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anindya.